So this video is going to be talking about, um, we're still on World War I. We're talking about like the style of fighting, which was trench warfare. We're also gonna be talking about some of the new weapons that are gonna be involved in the war. Um, the United States had actually stayed out of the war for quite a while, or they tried to, and then um, eventually they were going to end up getting involved. So we're gonna be talking about how they got involved and why that was important. So to start off with, I have this really, well, I think it's interesting, um, primary source, um, just describing what the front was like. So let me shrink this a little bit so we can actually see it. Um, so it says, we arrived at the front line just over a week ago, and the smell was so bad that many of the men were sick. To describe the smell would be an impossible task, but some of the causes will give you an idea of just how bad it is. Raw sewage from the open cesspit, body over odor from men who haven't had a decent wash for weeks, dead bodies rotting in shallow graves and laying in the open in no man's land, the smell of exploded bombs and the odor of mustard gas, which lingers for a few days after the attack, stagnant mud cigarette smokes, smoke and cooking smells all add to the unpleasantness of the trenches. So when people talk about World War I, they often talk about how like psychologically traumatizing it was. And some of that had to do with like the incredible amount of death and the style of fighting. People were fighting out of trenches, which I think as we get into that, you'll see why that impacted people's lives so much. And I also want to just show you where some of the trenches were and where the front lines were. And also, you guys, there was um, so many new weapons that people had never seen before. And some of them were simply terrifying. So this is a map of um, World War I, some of the major front lines. So you see everywhere that there's a red here, that is somewhere that there was trenches. Now, a trench is like, um, let me show you some more information about trenches. Trenches are basically giant holes dug in the ground. So here's what one actually looked like. Um, this guy is standing. And a lot of times, because of their location, they would be filled with water. So um, trenches were terrible places to be. But just think about that. If you want to advance your line, you literally are going to have to dig hundreds of miles of trench. And you can still see World War I trenches in Europe. A lot of them have become filled in now. Um, but this is kind of how they were built. So you would have these little boards on the bottom because the um, mud would make it really mushy. Um, and then the sandbags would be where you kind of go to shoot over. As the war progressed, sometimes they were actually using bodies in there. And then, um, so you're fighting across like trench to trench. And in the middle of those trench is called no man's land, because you know that if anybody is going to run into no man's land, they're for sure going to get shot. So sometimes people are using things like gas, um, to they would like drop the gas in the trench and then people would have to jump out of the trench because the mustard gas would kill them otherwise. So if you were going to advance your front lines, you'd have to run and invade the enemy's trench. So another thing that people talk about were the corpse rats and it's really disgusting. Here's a picture of them. Um, here's a description. We must look out for our bread. The rats have become much more numerous lately because the trenches are no longer in good condition. The rats here are particularly repulsive. They are so fat, the kind we called corp corpse rats. They have shocking, evil, naked faces, and it's nauseating to see their long, nude tails. So literally, these rats were so used to eating people's food, and they were getting used to eating the dead bodies because I mean, there was so much, there were so many dead bodies. There was so much death that, um, I mean, the rats became dangerous to the point where sometimes they would um, attack people in their sleep. And here's the other nasty part about World War I. Because people were fighting in those trenches, it was causing trench foot. I know this is unpleasant to look at, um, but it would literally cause your feet to rot while they're still on your body. And so a lot of people actually would die from trench foot because eventually trench foot would cause gangrene. Okay, so um, this is a new kind of war. So armies were fighting from the protect protection of deep ditches to defend their positions. Um, the system of trenches only on the Western front, front extended for about 400 miles. 
Um, I already told you that no man's land was that area between opposite trenches where a lot of the fighting took place. And one thing that made it so shocking during World War I was that we had um, all these new weapons that increased the, increased the killing exponentially. Like up until this point, people were hand-to-hand -hand combat fighting. So sometimes they would use really clumsy like muskets and stuff like that, but they hadn't had anything like a machine gun. And a machine gun is one of the inventions um, that made World War I so deadly. They also had huge guns that fired artillery shells. A lot of them contained um, poisonous gas. The one they always talk about is mustard gas or chlorine gas. Um, it usually had like a very strong odor. And it said like primary sources have talked about how when it was breathed in or touched your skin, it would instantly burn whatever it touched. So it was killing people from the inside out a lot of times. So if you would inhale the mustard gas, it would burn all the inside of your lungs. So Part of the challenge is that this happened kind of in the middle of the war where they started being exposed to mustard gas. So they had to quickly come up with a way to protect themselves against mustard gas. Do you know that one of the first strategies people used to protect themselves from poisonous gas before they had gas masks? Um, they were using cloth soaked in urine because that's what they had. And the ammonia somehow, I believe it was the ammonia, would help... Um, filter out some of that. They also had airplanes and tanks, which again, airplanes had not been used in war. So this provided a whole new um, way of looking at war. Tanks were still very clumsy, but um, a lot of, they weren't bu bulletproof. They would get stuck on the trenches. I'll show you a picture of a tank. Um, and also the Germans invented something called the U-boat. It was an early version of a submarine. They were terrifying. People couldn't see those submarines. They didn't know where they were coming from. So it made the war like very unpredictable. And those German U-boats were sinking a ton of supply ships. And this is going to become a problem because before the United States is involved in the war, we're going to start selling stuff to the allies. We're also going to be giving out loans to the allies. So when the Germans come in and sink our boats, we're going to get mad because that's our money. That's our stuff that's being lost. So even though we're not involved in the war yet, we're going to start having some losses just because the U-boats are going to um, attack our ships. Also, it's going to be called, um, what the Germans are using is called an unrestricted submarine warfare. Okay, and I told you guys that I would show you um, some of the weapons of World War One. I. I wanted to give you a couple pictures, so I went and grabbed some of those quick for you. Um, okay, so here they are. Sorry, my computer is being slow to load. Um, but here's some of the first airplanes. Not super safe if you're being shot at. Definitely easy to take that person out. But again, our weapons aren't going to be long range enough um, to be super accurate, like shooting down planes. So um, from the United States, we actually had a group called the Red Barons. I think I'm right about that. I hope that's not World War II. Anyway, um, so yeah, so airplanes were going to be dropping bombs and mustard gas, mostly mustard gas, and some of their more heavily, heavy artillery is going to come from those. Here's one of the first tanks. I told you guys it wasn't super, it wasn't super, um, effective at first. These tanks would get hung up on the um, on the trenches, but sometimes they could be helpful in getting across. The machine gun was probably one of the biggest like game changers um, because it was able to kill a lot more people a lot faster, especially in the trenches where like vision is kind of blurred. And here's some of those first submarines or the U-boats. Um, so when it's coming to around 1917, moving into 1918, the war on the Western Front had become a stalemate. It's where both sides were equally matched, so neither side could win. So um, the death totals from battles such as Verdun and the Somme had reached almost a million. So there was a, so much um, carnage already. And um, part of the war that that sometimes we don't talk about as much is the war at sea. 
Um, each side had dependent had been dependent on supplies brought on brought by ships, and the British Navy was able to cut off supplies heading for Germany. And on the other side of it, um, German U boat boats were sinking ships carrying supplies to the Allies. And like I said, a lot of those were coming to America. But at the time, the president of the United States was President Wilson, and he was insisting that the United States would stay neutral. However, um, we were still trading with Europe because we were making a lot of money on that. So because at the time, Europe was kind of at a standstill. So they couldn't, I mean, all of their men, all their supplies, all of their land was going to the war, like uh, farmland where people used to grow stuff was filled with trenches and it was being destroyed. So um, the U.S. was sending ships carrying supplies mostly to the Allies. Um, also, American banks were giving loans in the form of war bonds. Basically, you buy like a bond and then that's sort of like your way of giving them a loan. So you'll be like, OK, well, you're going to pay me back for this later. I'll cash this in later. So um, this is going to be what is going to draw America kind of into the war. So first of all, submarine warfare. So the rules of war required warships to search merchant ships rather than sink them. Um, submarines, which were defenseless on the um, ocean surface, were often attacking first. So this was the Germans that were just sinking any ship that they saw in the water, even if it was carrying supplies, even if it was a passenger ship. And here's the big problem comes when um, there's a British passenger ship called the Lusitania, and it's going to be sunk by a German U-boat. U-boat, And there was um, 128 Americans on there, but 1,200 people died. But here's, here's the catch. Americans were really angry about this because they thought it was Germans were sinking a passenger ship, but the Lusitania was carrying supplies and weapons to Great Britain. So to be fair to Germany, they weren't wrong about sinking it, but a lot of innocent people died. So Americans were outraged. And remember, um, Germans and Austria-Hungary doesn't want to get um, America involved because they don't want to tip that balance of power. Um, Americans were fresh too, so they didn't want you know fresh soldiers coming in. So after that comes the Sussex Pledge. So after sinking um, the French passenger ship called Sussex, Germany agreed not to sink merchant ships without warning. So in the United States, we had the election of 1916. Republican candidate Charles Evan Hughes charged that Wilson had not defended American interests, but Wilson ended up winning that re-election mostly because he had been able to avoid war. Germany, however, made a big mistake, and they resumed unrestricted submarine warfare in January 1917. So they started firing on any ships that they saw. And remember, the Americans are still salty about um, the sinking of the Lusitania because that had some Americans and some of our stuff on it. And the real game changer is uh, the Zimmerman note. So there was a secret note sent by Arthur Zim Zimmerman um, to Mexico, asking that Mexico would ally with Germany against the United States. So basically, he was trying to say, Mexico, why don't you go ahead and invade the United States and we will back you up. Some people actually believe that the Zimmerman note was not even real, like that, they, that somehow the American government made that up um, so that we... It, just Americans would get mad enough that they would support the war, which wouldn't be outrageous considering how the Spanish-American War went um, when yellow journalism and the sinking of the Maine convinced Americans to support that war. So um, Americans were outraged about the secret telegram when it was found out. So Wilson asked for a declaration of war, which Congress gave him in April 6th of 1917. Now, don't forget that up until this point, we were kind of getting involved on in a separate way. And that was that we had been giving, selling supplies and giving loans to the allied countries. So as we were getting more concerned that, that we were going to lose, it's not surprising that we found a way to get involved because we needed to protect our investment. And then with the Sinking of Lusitania and the Zimmerman note, that kind of clinched it. So the United States is going to enter the war in the middle of 1917.